All right, let's go ahead and get started. Amen. Those of you out there in the behind the tent, out in the ball field area, come on in. We're going to get started. And looking forward to what God's going to do this week. We've been praying, we've been working, and we're looking forward to see what God's going to do. I see a lot of folks have shown up. I hope I want to see God show up, though. Amen. May he manifest himself to us this week and deal with us and work in our hearts, save souls and challenge the hearts of Christians. Um, I want to say thank you to all the folks that have worked, I mean worked hard in the last several weeks and even up until this week here. Last, uh, this past week we, we had folks come and help put the tent up and we had um, folks selling t-shirts back here and and all of the different things have been going on, the meals that were prepared for, for all the workers and yesterday and today, and uh, all the altar workers that have uh, volunteered to work in that. And just uh, God has been bringing everything together. And uh, that's just the way it happens. And so I'm glad for that and thank, thankful for it. And uh, let's have the... Uh, the crusaders come they're going to come and they're going to lead us in some congregationals and they're going to sing with us and uh let's see let's just put um them up here right now and let's get started amen as they're coming let's have a word of prayer and let's ask the lord to meet with us amen let's pray father i thank you for what you've already done i thank you that uh, you're already dealing with the hearts of people and bringing them here drawing them to this place. And Lord, I pray that uh, you'd be here. We rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus and his shed blood and command them to leave. pray that you'd send your holy angels to camp, and camp around this tent. And Lord, I pray that you would do a mighty work in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would uh, stir the lives and hearts of people here that are Christians. And Lord, I pray that you would save the lost to Bless us in this service, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's all stand and let's sing victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story. somebody that you're glad to see them tonight.
song. Peace. 
praise tonight all right want to we're going to take up an offering here but before we do I just want to say something um, and I think the the preachers that are here will agree with me these altars down here are always open you don't need to wait till somebody tells you to come on you don't need to wait till the end of the service or for the preacher to say, come down and get. If God's speaking to your heart, you need to move right then. Because if you don't, you may be telling him no and he may not ever speak to you again like that. So when he speaks, you obey. Amen. And if you need help, somebody will help you. But these altars are always open. Just want to let you know that. Let's have the men come forward. And we need to receive an offering. Now, this offering goes to the expense of this meeting. So, uh, did you get some men already? Amen. We need some help here. Where'd, come on, Brother Ronnie. Need at least three, right? Don't step on that, baby. <laughs> All right. Well, I sure appreciate all that Brother Richie does and has done around here. I know he don't like people to say that kind of stuff about him. But uh, I've been watching him, and I'm impressed with what God does through him. I'm not necessarily saying I'm impressed with him, although I am. But I want to brag on the Lord and say that God has done a wonderful thing through this man in this community. And I'm thankful for him. Amen. And if it wasn't for... Him really pushing this thing, it would have died. He's kind of been, and God put it on his back and a few other people, and they just been carrying it, him and a couple other people. And uh, I, yes, amen. It's wonderful. It's wonderful when God's people obey him. So I, I just wanted to say that. I want him to ask a blessing on this offering and this Crusaders are going to sing, and I'm going to get out of the way for a minute. Amen. Go ahead and pray, bro. Just 
the streets of gold. When my feet touch the streets of gold. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It feels like home being back at Clarendon. This is the third year that we've had the opportunity to participate in the crusade, and uh, I'm telling you, it was a joy, and as we were making our way from Baton Rouge, Louisiana yesterday, uh, we got out of prison yesterday, amen, can I get a witness? Uh, uh, but we were down in Angola prison for a, uh, a two-day re revival, and so uh, we were excited to be going back there for the second year, and uh, you say you're excited about going to prison, I'm excited to go wherever God tells me to go, amen. that's where I get excited about, and so we were... We're down there and left and got uh, into the beautiful city of Clarendon, Arkansas about midnight last night. And uh, so it was wonderful to, to be here and to pull up out here at the ball field. Usually we're out here all alone. The bus is usually out here and, you know, it's been downtown at the Civic Center. But uh, when Brother R Richie called me and told me that they were going to do a tent revival, I said, yeah. I got excited about that because uh, we've been doing some tent revivals and something special about a tent revival. I don't know. It's just something special. There's no bounds out here. Can I tell you that? The, these curtains, you can push on them and you can go right through them. It ain't like a wall in a church. And so I want to tell you, you, you be obedient. As our, our brother said a while ago, I, I was thankful that he said that about the altars. The Lord had done put that on my heart. You're not going to bother us one little bit, and I'm sure that you're not going to bother Brother Kelly. If you move and you be obedient to what he tell, the Lord tells you to do, and then we'll have church. Amen? Amen. And most of all, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're in the best place you can be right now. Open your heart up and listen to what God's going to speak to you tonight. And you don't even have to wait till the invitation to get saved. You can be like Zacchaeus and make haste and come on down. Somebody will meet you. I promise you that. I promise you. We are honored. I want to introduce everybody to you, and then we're going to get back to it. Um, I told Brother Jeff, I said, we're going to Clarendon. He said, where is that at? Uh, You'll have to pardon him. He's not from around here. And, uh, but Jeff's been with us about a, a month and a half now, and uh, he's doing a wonderful job. Uh, we found him in Gonzales, Louisiana, but he's from Birmingham, Alabama originally. Would you make Mr. Jeff Brown welcome singing tenor? <laughs> back in the back, we've got a little guy back there. He's, uh, well, he's... Getting close to being 21, aren't you there, Stephen? I uh, am. Yeah, well, ain't that something? Boy, maybe he'll put on some weight. Amen? Uh, we've been feeding him a lot of chicken. I think he's gained 30 pounds since he started with us. And, uh, but he takes care of our sound and our video. And by the way, this uh, is being streamed live on the Internet right now. You can go to thecrusaders-ministries.com. You can take out your phone. You've got two minutes and text your friends. And then put your phone back up, okay? I don't want to catch you in there texting, all right? But you can watch this online. It'll be streamed every night. Also, if you'd like a video copy of this after the service, uh, you can get a DVD of the, of the services that are going on. See Stephen, and for a donation, he'll take care of you. But Stephen is a man that's after God's heart. He loves the Lord. And I, I pray that before the week's over, he can share a little bit about what God's doing in his life. Would you make Mr. Stephen Hayes welcome from Queen City, Texas? Back there beside him is uh, Jeff's wife, Noel. She is assisting uh, Stephen back there. Thank the Lord we got Stephen an assistant. I'm telling you. And, uh, you know, but she is uh, just a, a jewel. And um, for the last month and a half, she's been helping out. Would you make Miss Noel Brown welcome? Yeah. Jeff and Noel have two boys, five and eight years old, Isaac and Isaiah. Would wave to them, guys. Wave to them. Yeah. This young man has been singing the lead. A lot of you know him. He's been, uh, I'm thankful to have my son to stand beside me and to sing. He writes a lot of our songs, plays the guitar. Would you make Mr. Jonathan Talley welcome? Setting up here on the front row, uh, she is a vital part of the ministry. She doesn't get up here on the platform 
but she's into so many other things about the ministry. Every, every good man, if there's a good man, I guarantee there's a better wife behind him. Amen. And, uh, it, but she is just the love of my life for the last 31 years. Would you make my wife, Penny Talley, welcome? We have an awesome leader, an awesome man of God that uh, is, is not only a spiritual leader to us, but he's also a mentor to myself and to the guys, and he's an awesome mentor to my boys. Would y'all make Mr. David Talley welcome? To the Savior. Aren't you glad we don't have to go through no priest? Aren't you glad that we can just call on him right now? And he says he hears us when we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to tell you, I get excited about Jesus because I know what he did for this old boy. Amen. He is just an awesome God. In Philippians 2, verse 9, the Bible says that he was exalted. And he was given a name above all names, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and below. My friend, his name is Jesus. Listen to the message of the song. His name is Jesus, the one who died. He saved my life And He gave me sight And He's coming back one day When that trumpet will blow this man who died will save your life and he will call you home. You may have problems that you don't understand. Just call on 
it was probably must have been two last year was brother ed hale here last year or the year before i can't remember now see as a year before we we were here with brother ed hale and uh we've become good friends with brother ed and um brother ed wrote this song that we want to do and then we finished this song brother uh I, I'm, I'm anxious for the word amen i'm anxious for the word and uh but one of the things I love about the message of this song, it just says Jesus covered it all. And my friend, when Jesus washes your sins away, it covers them all. It, it doesn't do a portion of them. And I want you to understand that because uh, Satan will creep up on you and he'd say, you ain't no good, you ain't no good. But my friend, Jesus covers it all. Listen to the message of this song. Free. 
from all the shackles and chains of my mind. And now I am singing a brand new song of how Jesus saved me. Last time we were here, that wouldn't have ever happened for me to get up and share. But there's been a change, see. Um, been doing this all of my life. Started playing the drums when I was nine. Age of 13, started singing lead like I'm doing now. I'm 18 now. Um, been doing this all my life, like I said. But just because you do something good doesn't make you, just, you're not going to go to heaven. See, I don't, it doesn't matter if you're a good person. You're not going to get to heaven by good works. It's by knowing one man that died for you. And we were doing a prison service, and it was just an awesome move. There was, there was 34 men that got saved that night. And that's like, there's more people that need to move. There's someone out there that's holding back. He's like, there's someone out there. And I've, and he's been saying this. He had started saying this probably, he's been saying it for a long time, but it stuck to me for about a year. And it's like, okay, you know, and I'd start praying, Lord, who, would, Lord, move that person, Lord. And February the 22nd, I realized that the person that needed to move was me. There were some situations going on with me and my girlfriend, just life stuff. And I realized that I was lost. And I told her that. And she's like, you're what? I'm like, I'm lost. She, so she went and got mom and dad. And dad said, what's going on? And I said, I'm lost. He said, what do you mean? I said, if I die, I'm going to hell. And he said, well, what do you want to do about it? I said, I want to get saved. He said, what you waiting on? And um, to know that God didn't give up on me when other people would. And that he cared enough to die for me and for me to realize that knowing that I've, I've realized that in my life see I prayed a prayer through in my head when I was nine see it came from here but it didn't come from here there's a difference in thinking and knowing and so February the 22nd I realized I was lost and I got saved Amen. and how I am living a brand new life I'm free all the shackles and chains of my mind
from me Oh, and it's so saved out of church pews and preachers get saved there may be some folks here that church members aren't saved there may, may be some people here that got saved a while back and they just continued on the same road that they were on they didn't get it you can go back to the well he said I'm, I'm living a new life because when he comes in he makes a change Boy, I tell you, that was good, brother. It's good stuff. Well, it's my privilege to introduce to you Brother Kelly Jones. He's the senior pastor at First Baptist Church in Harrisburg. And uh, he doesn't look like much. He did that to me this morning, so I'm getting him back. He is a Delta boy, though, so i got to be careful what I say because you all stone me. But I, I heard tell that his, he was so ugly when he was born that his mama had put him up in the corners, fed him with a slingshot, amen. <laughs> so pray for him as he comes to preach, and that'll keep your attention on him because you'll be saying, really, is that him? Mm-hmm. Come on, Brother Kelly. May I help you off the stage? Yes, please. I need help. <laughs> I don't think I was that ugly to him this morning. Man, was it that bad? Well, amen. Don't we appreciate the Crusaders? Thank you guys. We're scattered, I think, now, but uh, I appreciate you guys and sharing with us and leading us in worship and uh, what testimony just confirms what I uh, felt led of the Lord to preach tonight so uh, just uh, isn't it neat how God gets it just right every time yeah, yeah. we just trust him every now and then right, right. might have a lot more uh, go just like it should but uh, my name is Kelly Jones I am as brother uh, Scott said the pastor at First Baptist Church in Harrisburg and uh, uh, I'm a husband of 16 years and uh, I have four children uh, two boys, two girls, they're 10, 6, 3, and 2, so uh, we stay busy, as you can imagine, but uh, my wife, uh, Joan, and I have uh, been in Harrisburg for three years, and before that, we were in Manandewe at Arkansas, do y'all know where that is, uh, for, for four years down there at uh, First Baptist Church, but, uh, but I'm a native of Helena, uh, that's home, uh, Helena's a great place to be from, uh, it's, it's, a, it's uh, still home, my mom and dad still live there, I got a brother and sister that live there. Uh, but it'll always be home to me. Love to go back uh, to Helena. And uh, as a matter of fact, this week I'll end up in Helena at some point. Uh, you know, Mama, Mama wants her boy to come home every now and then, so I'll go home and see Mama. But, uh, but tonight, uh, as I've been uh, uh, contemplating, you know, what the Lord would have me to share with you, um, 
I didn't just contemplate it tonight. I mean, as, during the, uh, the last few weeks as I knew this was coming up and as Brother Scott invited me, I don't know, a couple of months ago to, to come and to uh, preach, I consider it a great honor to uh, be here with you tonight. And uh, I look forward to what the Lord's going to do. But I've been praying. I've been praying and praying and praying that God would do a great work and that uh, He would allow me to be a part of that work in whatever way He could, uh, but that He would move in a great way. And uh, tonight we prayed out there in the concession stand uh, for this evening, and I pray that God would just bring an awakening to this community and that this would be the epicenter from which it happens. And uh, uh, can you imagine what God would do if His people would just get themselves right with Him and get a burden to do what He's already commanded us to do? Uh, you know, I don't, you don't have to get a burden for the lost. God's already told you to, to go and share the gospel with the lost folks, and uh, some of you in here, you're lost. And uh, tonight, I hope that you will uh, heed the gospel that I share with you tonight from God's Word. But, uh, but you know, we don't have to wait till we get a burden uh, for the Lord to tell us to go share the gospel with somebody. We just need to be obedient and go do what He's already told us to do. Um, but tonight, I come to you uh, as a divine ambassador. Uh, I come to you as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, not because I'm anything special, as Brother Scott's already told you, you know, uh, not because of anything in, in and of myself. Uh, but because of who the Lord is in me, I come to you as a divine ambassador tonight, and I come representing the Lord, and I desire to share with you a message from the Lord, uh, from His Word specifically, because anything I say will come out of my mouth and fall straight to the ground. But I want to share to you the Word of God tonight and what He has to say to us. And uh, uh, before we go any further, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles. If you have a Bible with you tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And we'll read down through verse 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. If you would, would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, precious word. First, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Now I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Bible. Uh, it says in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for your word. And Lord, often as I pray, it is sermon enough. If we never say another word, Lord, your word has gone forth and I know that it will not return void. So tonight, Lord, as it goes forth into this tent and, and beyond this tent, Lord, to others who will hear what others share, of this word, Lord, may you use it to bring a harvest like we've never seen in, in before. Lord, do a great and mighty work in this place tonight. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, as I said, tonight I come as a divine ambassador to you. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of you in this room I don't know very well at all. I don't know you from, from Adam, uh, in a sense. I, I don't know you... Uh, like Brother Scott, I met two, uh, six months ago, and I've seen him twice now in the last six months. And today is the second time. But, uh, but uh, there is one other person in this room that I know very well, one of my former church members at uh, First Baptist DeWitt. It's a dear person of mine, so I know him a lot better than I know the rest of you. But let me tell you what I know about everybody in this room. There's two kinds of people in this room, and there ain't but two. And it ain't based on uh, uh, denomination, it ain't based upon uh, racial or ethnic or any other kind of drawing lines between there's two people in this room tonight. There's saved folks and there's lost folks. There's saints and there's ain'ts. Uh, that's the only two people there are in this room. And tonight, I want to help you to understand a little bit about where you are. And I hope that after you look at this passage of scripture with me, you'll have an understanding of where you stand. And how you can use the Word of God to examine your own life and determine, do I know the Lord or do I not? Am I a saint or am I ain't? Am I saved or am I lost? And you can look at this passage and you will figure out, if you truly will look at it, whether you're saved or whether you're not. And uh, tonight, here's what I want you to do. Number one, I want you to see recreation. In verse 17, there's recreation. 
If you know the Lord Jesus, you have been recreated in Him. And there's confidence that we can have in that through what verse 17 tells us there. He says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, any man, woman, boy, or girl, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, just above these verses here, tells us that we can have some confidence in who we are in Christ, that there is a difference that is made in our lives. Look there in verses 14 and 15, it says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that, all, excuse me, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. If you're a child of God, that means you've been placed in Jesus Christ. That means that when you got saved, you became a child of God and you've been placed in Him. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Remember this verse? The Apostle Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. Here's how I like to illustrate this truth of being in Christ. I think about being in an automobile. And anywhere that automobile goes, you go with it. If you're sitting in that car, everywhere that car goes, everything that car does, you do it because you're in the car. Well, the same way, Jesus Christ, when He died on a cross, because I placed my faith and trust in Him as my Lord and Savior, when He died on that cross, I died on that cross. When He was put in that grave, I was put in that grave. And when He rose from the grave, come on, I rose with Him. That's why when I am baptized... When I was baptized, my baptism, and I know there's some differing opinions maybe on this, but let me tell you what I believe about baptism. I believe, and you can read it also in uh, Romans chapter 6, it says that just like Christ was, uh, was, was, uh, uh, died and was buried and rose again, you and I, when we are saved, when we are baptized in, in the Lord, when we follow the Lord in baptism through obedience, we walk down into that water and we are dunked in that water. That symbolizes the old man dying. But we don't stay there. We are raised up and we are raised to walk in newness of life in Jesus Christ. And that's what baptism, in my opinion, pictures is that, hey, the old man is dead. We buried him in that watery grave. Right. Symbolically saying, hey, he's gone. But we didn't keep him there. Even though there have been some folks I've baptized that I'd like to keep there a little bit longer. But I don't. But, but we don't stay there. We're raised up to walk in newness of life. And just as Jesus Christ was buried, He didn't stay in the grave. Amen? What did we just celebrate a couple of, just the last Sunday, a week ago? We celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so, if any man is in Christ, if you truly know the Lord Jesus, here's what He says. Not only will you have confidence, and He was confident in this. He says, I can guarantee you, if somebody knows the Lord, here's what's going to be true. Number one, there's going to be a change. There's going to be something that changes about him. He's going to be, he says here, a new creature. God has done a work. If you truly came to know the Lord, God did a work in you. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. If you have been saved, God's doing a work in you. God has done a change in you. He's creating a new creature. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are His workmanship. I love what the brother said a while ago that, you know, we're not saved by works. I'm going to tell you, you can try to work your way to heaven all you want to, but I'm going to tell you, every work you do will be tainted because you can't earn your way to heaven. And you, when you try to trust in your own efforts and your own things, you're slapping Jesus Christ in the face and telling him, hey, it don't matter what you did on the cross. I'm going to get there myself. I'm going to get there on my own works. He says here, we're the workmanship of God. I'm just something that's being worked on by the Lord. And so he says, uh, you've been created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. So I'm going to be a new creature. This will be something different about me. He is making something new out of me. He says also, the old things have passed away. There's going to be a removal of the old man and his lifestyle. You know what? When you get saved, some of you, there may be a, an immediate change in your life. Your, your vocabulary may, may get a little bit smaller. <laughs> you know, some of you had a problem with cussing or something like that. You know, you may have lost all your vocabulary when you got saved. That's okay. There's more words out there. Come on. But, but listen, some of you, there may be an immediate change in some of the things about your life. But some of you took a little while. doesn't mean you didn't get saved. It means that God's taking a little time working those things out of you. But I'm here to tell you, if you did get saved, those things are going to pass away. Right. That appetite that you had for sin and all that, it's still going to be there underlying, but God's giving you a new nature because He's giving you His Holy Spirit who lives within you to help you develop that new nature and your desires are going to begin to change. You're going to begin to want the things that God wants and you're still going to struggle with that, that sinful nature and it's still going to be a battle to the day you go to be with the Lord. But He says, I'm going to take those things and they're going to pass away. They're going to be gone. I'm going to tell you, I'm a new man today. I got saved when I was 12 years old, and as a, as a young 12-year-old boy, I went to my brother, Jay, who was uh, 11 years older than me, and he was a, uh, just a second father in my life. Uh, my father was there for me, but my brother was being much older than me. 
He was just like a second dad to me. And, and uh, my brother, at a time when my parents were not walking with the Lord, my brother was. And, and when he would come home from college and, and uh, he and I would share a bed because of space purposes. I'm, a, I'm one of four children. And so we would share a room there and share a bed at night. And, and uh, one night, the, the Lord had just been dealing with me about being lost. I'd been to church enough to know. Uh, I'd heard the gospel enough from the preachers that were preaching. I knew that, that I had never trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And God was just reeling me in, drawing me to himself for the, through the whole Holy Spirit, and so I asked Jay, I said, Jay, are you eligible to save people? Because <laughs> I was ready to get saved, you know, and I said, Jay, are you eligible to save people? And he said, well, Kelly, I, uh, I don't do the saving, God does the saving, but I can tell you how to be saved. And so as a 12-year-old boy, right there in my bedroom, in my bed, before I went to bed that night, my brother Jay shared with me how to trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now, I hadn't done a whole lot of bad things as a 12-year-old boy, but I'd done my share, but, uh, uh, but, but I knew... The moment I got saved, there was something different about me. And here's what happens is the change starts on the inside. It's what the Lord begins to do on the inside. And in, in the inside, what's on the inside begins to work its way out. And it begins to change some things. He says here, when a man is in Jesus Christ, there's going to be a change that takes place. Those old things are going to pass away. They're going to go. And it doesn't mean it's not going to be a struggle, but they're going to go away. But he says, behold, new things have come. There's going to be some new stuff happening in your life. There's going to be some new things that you're going to begin to want to do and love to do. And, and there's going to be some new things about you. And I'm going to tell you, other people are going to notice those things about you. Uh, you know, and, and the thing is, some of you may think and may, may have made a decision, as brother was talking about, you know, you've walked an aisle before. You've, you've been saved or you felt like you've been saved before. But you know what? The rest of the folks around you know whether you have or not. Because the Bible talks about fruit. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a horticulturist. Is that the right word? When you, when you know what's... Is that how you say that? Uh, what, about, I don't know, plants and things like that. But I'm smart enough to know an apple tree from an orange tree. I'm smart enough to figure that out because an apple tree hopefully has apples on it, an orange tree, oranges. You know, a child of God, it's pretty easy to spot a child of God because they have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their life. If they don't have it, if they got the, the fruit of the flesh, it's pretty obvious. And there's some of you maybe that you've made that decision as a child or maybe as, a, as an adult and you, you, just, you made a, 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 a change in religion maybe or you made some choice but nothing new really ever happened in your life. The Bible says that there will be old things passing away and new things are going to come in your life. Ephesians 4.24 says that we're to put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Uh, I got to thinking about... Uh, Something being just totally different than it was before. And uh, I didn't know he was going to be here tonight, but a friend of mine is here, Brother Mark Hargrove out here. And I got to thinking about something that looked one way before, and then when it was all done, it was just a totally different thing. Brother Mark bought a house, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, Brother Mark, but bought a house, and, and he and Miss Joyce, his wife, they uh, did some remodeling to this house. And I'll tell you, this house before, it was like it was stuck in probably about the 1960s, 1970s. But when they got through with this house, I mean, it was just a totally different house. It was a house that you could never even imagine was the same house that it was before. Why? Because it had been recreated. That house had been, had been totally redone and shaped and molded and, and developed into this whole new house, that one that they could use for what they wanted to use it for. And then now, in our lives, if you take that same illustration, when you come to know Jesus Christ, the old person that you were has changed. And God begins to mold you and to make you and to shape you into something that He can use. Because in your old self and the old way you were, you're not fit for use for the Lord. I don't mean to offend you by saying that, but you're just not fit for use for what the Lord wants to do with you. But, so He begins to mold and to shape and to make you into Jesus Christ, to look like Jesus and to take the things that don't look like Christ and to make, them, to make you look like Christ. And so listen to me carefully when I say this. And I don't want to confuse anybody, but I want to be as straightforward and truthful with you as I can. If there's been no change in your life since you got saved, and you did not get saved. That's right. That's right. It's plain and simple. If there's been no change in your life since you got saved, there has been no salvation. I don't know what you got, but it was not Jesus. Because he says the old things are going to pass away, the new things are going to come, and if there's anything really new in your life, then you may have come to know the Lord. You must have come to know the Lord. But if there's never been any change in your life, Yes, you can, you can uh, coast around for a little while. You can, you can alter your appearance on the outside and the things you do for a little while, but I'm here to tell you, you're going to run out of steam. At some point, you're going to run out of yourself. And everybody else is going to know, all right, this was not genuine. And the sad thing is, is that there are churches full of folks who think they know the Lord. And they don't. And again, I'm not here to try to confuse you about your salvation, but, but, if, but there are those of you who know 
You know you never got saved. I don't have to tell you. You know you never did. And you need to get that right. You need to settle that. Now, moving on. Uh, some of you tonight, the Holy Spirit's convicting. He's convincing your heart right now that you've never really been saved. You need to settle that before we leave tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, if you look over, he says, Behold, uh, for he says, At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When should you get saved? If you've discovered tonight, if the Holy Spirit has convicted you that you're lost, Tonight's the night you need to get saved. You don't need to wait till tomorrow night. You don't need to wait till two nights from now. You need to get saved tonight. Because now is the time. It's not tomorrow. Today is the time. And here in just a little while, we're going to have some counselors that will be standing down here, and they'd love to share with you how you can come to know Jesus Christ for sure for your, as your Lord and Savior tonight. Before you leave this place, you can leave here knowing that you know the Lord. Be saved today. But if you determine, in fact, you are saved, you know the Lord, then you need to understand a couple more things about yourself from this passage that we see. Something about this salvation that you possess. Number one, when you get saved, there's going to be a recreation. God's going to take you and He's going to begin to mold and shape you into a new likeness to look more like Christ and to be like Christ. He's going to be making some changes in you. Yeah, it may not be overnight, but it's going to be over time. He's going to really make you into a new person. I guarantee you I'm a different person today. Even after several years of being saved, I'm a different person today at the age of 38 than I was when I was 18. God has just done a work in me because of what He wanted to do in and through me, and He's been doing that for a long time. And sometimes it takes a little while with some of you for Him to get you where He wants you to be. Look in verse 18. We see not only recreation, but now we see responsibility. In verse uh, 18 it says, Now all these things, what things? These new things. These new things that He's bringing in your life. He says these things, they're from God. Who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Number one, we see there's a responsibility that happens. He says there's an experience that takes place. He says you've been reconciled to God. How did that happen? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, down a little bit later, later there it says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on your behalf. Here's what's wrong. The Bible says in, in, I believe it's Genesis chapter 3, that Adam and Eve, who were walking with God in, in peace and harmony, in right relationship with God. They were with God together. But when Eve was deceived by that serpent and she ate of that fruit that God commanded them not to eat of, she was separated from God because of sin. And a husband who tried to blame it on his wife. Husbands, we try to do that sometimes. Well, it's that old woman you gave me, God. It's her fault. And she tried to blame the, the, the serpent, you know, but it's, it's always what we do, don't we? We just try to blame somebody else for what we do. My son, my 10-year-old boy is bad about that. He never wants to take responsibility for what he does. But he, 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 uh, Adam tried to blame Eve. Eve tried to blame the serpent. But either way, they were separated from God. They were torn apart. Now the word reconciliation, it says in that passage that, that we were reconciled to God. What, is it, what does it mean to be reconciled? Well, I'm sure some of you have a bank account and you know that your, your bank statement each month, you have to reconcile that bank statement. Hopefully you do. And what it is, you've got two balances that differ. Your checkbook balance and the bank balance differ. And a lot of times you may feel like, you know what, somebody's wrong here. I feel like i got more money. i still got checks left, you know, and that's not the way it works. But... Uh, but sometimes, you know, those, those balances differ. And what you try to do is you try to make them reconcile, bring them back together again so that they agree, so that they're one again. The same amount. And what you do is you take your outstanding deposits, your outstanding checks, and you balance those things out to where it all comes back together as one. Well, listen, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, man was separated from God and they were distant. And God, from that point on, has been striving to bring into existence the Messiah who would come, Jesus Christ, who would be the one that would reconcile man back to God. And so all those folks in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to a, to a Messiah that would come to help bring them back to a relationship with God. And us in the New Testament time and beyond, we were looking back to a Savior who did come, who died on a cross so that we could have a right relationship with God. And so, so that, that broken relationship between us and God, the goal is to bring that relationship back together. And so if you don't know the Lord Jesus, you're still separated from God. And when you come to know Christ, what God does is He brings you back together in right relationship with Him. He says, I reconcile you to myself so that now we're in a right relationship once again and we are where we ought to be. And so he says here, God reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. So there's an experience that takes place. It's not just something that, you know, hey, I just feel like this happened or I just, you know, my mom and daddy were Christians so I must be a Christian too and all this hoopla. No, it doesn't work that way. He says you've got to experience a reconciled relationship with God. And how does that happen? Through Jesus Christ. He said he reconciled us through Christ to himself. 
And now the next thing we see also is, he gives that explanation in there. He said, in Christ, reconciling the world to himself there in verse 19. Namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He said, I used Jesus Christ as the one that I used to bring man back to myself. And he says, how does he do that or what does that mean? It means that there is a, a, a forgiveness that takes place. I love that they use this verse as they were singing this song, but, but in Christ, he's reconciling the world to himself. That speaks of agency, that Christ was the agent through which God did that. Remember what John 14, 6 says? Christ is not a way, a better way, or a good way. He is the only way. Uh, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So he says, through Jesus Christ, I brought him to myself. But then we see the part of forgiveness. He says, not counting their trespasses against them. I love Psalm 103, 12. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from one another. We had a little, uh, little joke back there in, in the a counseling area, I don't know which way is west. I mean, I do know which way west, east, and all that is. But when I, if I'm standing right here, I can't tell you which way west is, but I think it's this way, right? Am I right? Where's my, where's my guy that was, uh, he really knew where it was. It's this way. But listen, I know enough about east, west, north, and south that if I start heading east, when will I find west? I will not. If I start heading north, I'm going to start heading north. Eventually, I'm going to get up to the North Pole. I'm going to see old Santa Claus, and I'm going to start going south at some point, right? So I will find south at some point. But if I start heading east or if I start heading west, I will not find the other. That's what he says about our sin. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he says, I wash your sin away as far as the east is from the west. You will never find it. And so that's what he says through Jesus Christ. He says, I didn't count their trespasses against them. Why? Because I put the penalty of your sin upon Jesus Christ. He paid your debt. You owed it, but Jesus paid it for you. And so he says, I'm not going to count that against you. It's been paid in full. So here's the expectation. At the last part of verse 18, he says, I reconciled you through Jesus Christ. And he just explains what it is in verse 19. But then in verse 18 we see, he says, I gave you the ministry of reconciliation. There are some of you in this room, you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved, and you could swing over hell on toilet paper with a water pistol. You're so ready to go to heaven. You're ready. But I'm here to tell you, you've got a responsibility that comes with that. There's an expectation upon you that you've been given the reconciliation ministry to be helping others come to faith in Jesus Christ. And he's committed that word of reconciliation to us. He says, I have committed to you as something of great value. I've entrusted this to you. Who's he done that to? If you've been saved, he has entrusted it to you. Here's the deal. Let me illustrate it for you this way. Uh, in my, I'm sure it's the same way over here in this area too. In my church and in my community there in Harrisburg, I can't tell you how many times over and over again on Wednesday nights in our prayer meeting, we're praying for people with cancer. People dying of cancer. People just finding out they've got cancer. We were talking tonight about uh, Brother Charles. I think y'all were talking about this uh, with, with uh, stage four cancer. And, and uh, what would it be like? What would it be like if, if I would uh, know that somebody had cancer and was dying? And yet I knew the cure for it. And I didn't tell them. I just let them die. Let their loved ones go through the pain and sorrow of losing their loved one. When I knew I had the cure for cancer, what would that be like? And you'd run me out on a railroad. You'd stone me. Who was this? I throwing stones a while ago, bro. Scott, I mean, you would stone somebody for that kind of mess. You had the cure and you didn't share it with me? Tell me what the difference is in that and you knowing the cure for sin and not sharing it with your lost friends, your lost family members, your lost neighbors. Man, that's, worth, that's worse than anything. You've been reconciled to God. You who are a sinner that was separated from God, you've been reconciled to Him, and you know what it's like to be lost and to be found again, to be reconciled and right with God, and you, you know somebody else is still lost, but you don't tell them how to come to Jesus. You don't tell them how to be saved. You're worse than somebody that has a cure for cancer that doesn't share it with somebody else. He says, I've given you now a ministry of reconciliation. You've, rec you've been reconciled. Now you need to help others become reconciled. You can't save them. Even though I asked my brother, can you save me? He can't do that. But you can lead other people to him. You can bring other people in. And so if nothing else happens as a result of this camp meeting or this, this tent meeting here, there may not be anybody walk down this aisle tonight or any other night and get saved. But if you get on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ and you take... 
your holiness on out there <laughs> and you start sharing the gospel with other people, hey, do it. Yeah. Tell other people about Christ, but it gets worse in a good way. Moving on, not only being recreated and being responsible, representation. The next thing, representation. Number one, in verse 20, he says, Therefore, in light of the fact that God has given you and I as children of God the ministry of reconciliation, He's entrusted to us the cure for sin. He says, Therefore, in light of that, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. What a weight. What a weight that is. It's unique. Number one, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Who's, rec who's an ambassador for Jesus Christ? Anybody that's ever come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You represent Jesus Christ. Due to your being reconciled, now you are a minister of reconciliation. You are an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember what Acts chapter 1 verse 8 said, but you will receive power. You done? Acts chapter 1 verse 8 said, But you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what Christ commanded His disciples at that time. He said, This is what I expect of you. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to go out and you're going to do these things. It is a unique representation. It's not for anybody else. i am tell you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not an ambassador for Christ. You need to come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And there is no plan B. I'm here to tell you that if the church, if you and I, those of us who know the Lord, don't go out and tell other people about Jesus, He doesn't have a plan B. He's not going to bring aliens in here. He's not going to bring in somebody else or use some other things. Yeah, He can make the rocks cry out if He wants to. He can use a donkey. He can do whatever He wants to do, but He's not. He said, I left you to do it. That's why, you know, I've got some people in my church, and I know some of you may disagree with me about this, but there are some that would say, well, what if we just don't tell them? What about people off in these countries where daylight doesn't even get to? And what if we just don't tell them about Jesus and then God's just going to let them in by His grace, right? No! He left you and I to go tell them. It's our responsibility to go. It's not like this military uh, motto, don't ask, don't tell. No! We've got to go tell them because if they don't hear, they will not be saved. So we're His unique representatives. And if we don't tell them, they will die and they will spend eternity in hell, separated from God forever. We've got to go tell them. It's unique to us as believers. The last thing is, it's urgent. As a representative of the Lord, we have an urgent message, an urgent... Uh, it's just an urgent deed. I don't know what the way to say it is. There is a sense of urgency. I mean, you know, we're urgent about all kinds of things. We're urgent at Sonic, you know, when we want to get our, our mini blast. Some of you may get a major blast. I don't know. But, man, we're urgent about all the other. We're in a fast food generation. We want things just, just right now, right now, right now. Is there anything more urgent than rescuing people from the pit of hell? I mean, is there anything more, more urgent, more necessary? Look what he says. Look at the language he uses here. He says... Uh, it's as though God were making an appeal through us. Can you think of anybody that you could deliver a message that was more important than one from God? I mean, if you were in the military and you were giving a message, taking it from a general to somebody else, hey, I, I bring this message to you on behalf of General so-and-so, or hey, I'm, I bring this message to you on behalf of the President of the United States. You know, that may be kind of important, but I'm here to tell you there's nothing more important than to be a representative of God and that God were making an appeal through us. You see, that's what happens every time you share the gospel from your mouth to somebody else. God's making an appeal through you. God is using you as His tool to share the gospel with somebody else. And He says there, we beg you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. When's the last time you begged somebody to come to faith in Jesus Christ? When's the last time you had a sense of urgency in your life as a child of God to know that there was another person dying and going to hell to the point that you were urgently trying to see them come to faith in Christ? 2 Corinthians 5.11 says, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Do you really believe there's a hell? Do you really believe that if you did not get saved, that when you died, you would spend eternity in a, in a, in a place where the fires never quenched? If you really believe that, why don't you believe that for your friends and your family members? Why don't you believe that about the other people that are going to hell who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ? I thought about this illustration uh, over in Oklahoma. Do y'all remember when the I-40 bridge collapsed in Oklahoma and, and the story was told of this man who was down in a boat on the river there and, and uh, he knew that the bridge had collapsed but he could do nothing. 
Those people way up there on the bridge, you know, driving, plunging off. You remember how sad it was, those cars just going right off because they couldn't, they couldn't see, I guess, at the crest of the, of the bridge. They couldn't see that it was out and they just went to their death. And the guy down in the boat couldn't do anything. Man, he could yell, hey, the bridge is out, dung. And they couldn't hear him. They're in their cars. The windows are up. They're too far away. But what if he was up on top of that bridge? What if he was standing at the edge where the, where the, the bridge had collapsed and he was saying, wait, no, don't go. The bridge is out. The bridge is out. Do you think he'd have some urgency about him? What if we change it to a waterfall? Here you got folks fishing just, uh, I don't know what river it is, but the Niagara Falls. Is it Niagara River? I don't know. Whatever that body of water is, you know how it ends up. What if you were standing on the shore watching these people just happy-go-lucky canoeing down through there? You know, man, ain't got a care in the world. Hey, we're going off. We're just going down this river. And then you know that the water falls up here. And regardless of how happy they are, how oblivious they are to what's up ahead, you just sit back and say, hey, man, they sure are happy. <laughs> they're not going to be in a minute, <laughs> but they're happy now. Once again, nobody in their right mind would stand and watch somebody plummet to their death off a waterfall. And yet we do it every day. When we sit back and watch people, hey man, let's don't bother them. They're happy with their life. They're happy being lost. They're, they're happy going to their death. But nobody in their right mind would do that. But yet we do it every day if we're children of God and we don't warn other people about the dangers of hell. Uh, tonight, you have a responsibility as a representative of God. If you're a child of God, to beg people. Scripture says to go out into the hedges and the highways, compel them to come. When was the last time you compelled somebody to come to Jesus Christ? You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to know uh, umpteen verses of the Bible. You, you just have to be saved yourself. I'm going to tell you, God will take care of the rest. You open your mouth, God will fill it. I guarantee you. Tonight, I want to invite you to stand with me and bow your head and close your eyes. And those of you who are counselors, would you just come on and make your way over to my left here. And, and as these gentlemen come to, uh, to just play for us and to sing maybe, I want you to think about yourself tonight. There are some of you tonight that, as you heard the brother share his testimony about thinking he was saved and then figuring out, you know what, I don't know the Lord and getting that right, being saved. Some of you are right there. You've been, I, I'm not asking if you're a church member, if you've been baptized or anything like that. Some of you, you know you're lost. Some of you may not know it, but you sure are questioning it. And tonight, I want to give you an opportunity. As I hear just a moment, I'm going to have a word of prayer. And there's some folks standing over here to my left that would love to share with you how you can know for sure tonight that you know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you've been saved. Some of you, there's never been a change. You're still the same person you were before you made that decision. Tonight, you can change. And it's not to make your life better. Even though it will be in a lot of ways. <laughs> but it's so that you can come to know the one who loved you enough to send his son to die on a cruel cross so that you wouldn't have to. Tonight, I'd love for you to come and to share with one of these folks hey I don't know the Lord or I, I just I don't know if I do can you help me they'd love to talk with you about that but probably the more, majority of you, you already know the Lord in here and tonight some of the other points that we saw in this passage have spoken at your heart even have wrenched, wrenched, <laughs> wrenched your heart out rang it out because you know that you know people that are dying and going to hell and you are so more, much more passionate about so many other things than sharing the gospel with that person. Tonight, you need to come down and kneel at this altar maybe and just beg God to forgive you and to give you an opportunity to go and share Christ with them. You need to begin praying that God would already have been re re reeling them right in, drawing them to Himself so that when you go and you share the gospel with them, it'll be like taking candy from a baby, that they're so ready to be saved. Some of you, it's a family member. Some of you have got lost children lost mother, lost father, lost uncles, grandchildren, neighbors, co-workers. They're dying and they're going to hell. And you've got the cure for sin. What are you going to do with it? There may be something I have not even addressed. There may be some sin in your life that you know you know the Lord and you've, you've had some new things come into your life, but you've allowed yourself to creep back into that old man.
that old woman that's, that's doing some of the things you know you shouldn't be doing. You're saved, but you're as backslidden as there can be. You need to come kneel at this altar and confess that to the Lord. And just as Brother Dave said earlier, 1 John 1, 9 says that if we'll confess our sins to Him, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What has God brought you here tonight to do? Don't leave here without obeying Him and doing what He's brought you here to do. Father, tonight, Lord, uh, all across this room, there are men, women, boys, and girls who need to be saved. I pray that tonight they will come forward and they will take one of these counselors by the hand, let them take them out and share with them how they might come to know you as their Lord and Savior for sure tonight and leave this place knowing that they have a home in heaven. Recreate them tonight, Lord Jesus. And Lord, there are the others who are just questioning, Lord, they don't know if they know you or not. There are others that do know that they're lost, but there's others that don't know. Lord, they need to nail that down tonight. May they have boldness, courage to step forward and come. And let someone help them with that. Lord, there are others who have lost family members and loved ones on their mind tonight. I pray that they might come forward and weep over their lostness, Lord. And not be able to sleep at night until they have shared the gospel with that person or those persons. Lord, burden us tonight for lostness in Clarendon, Arkansas, in Brinkley, in Dewitt, in Harrisburg, wherever we live, wherever we are, Lord, burden us for the lostness of our communities. And may we not sleep at night knowing that there are those who are dangling over the fire of hell and we've got the rescue line that would help them. Lord, burden us tonight. May we see people saved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're coming, you come on as we sing. Don't wait. Today's the day. Call upon your name. Counselors are available. For all my life I've been a sinner. Therefore that I am a shame. lost family members, loved ones, friends, come pray for them. Come pray for them. I guess I must be weeping from the seas that I If you can't kneel down, just sit down. So sit down in the front row here. Lord, you For so long, oh yeah. But if you could spare some mercy, Lord, I pledge my life to Thee. Oh yes, I'm unworthy, Lord, to come.
Obviously, feel free to stand, but uh, I'm a father of four, as I told you, and I, I uh, becoming a father, 
It's radically altered my life in many ways. A lot of responsibility came upon me, but I, as I was sitting here thinking, I was just thinking about children and grandchildren. And there are some of you that uh, you have children that are maybe like mine, that are too young to even understand sin and the concept of God somewhat. But I'm burdened for uh, Psalm 78 talks about children who are yet to be unborn. Passing on the faith to children who are yet to be born because uh, you know it's a responsibility of parents and grandparents to take their faith and not pass on salvation but pass on the teachings of God's word to those children that come beyond them. And there's some of you tonight, you've got children, you've got grandchildren, some of you got children that you're too young to have haven't had children yet and one of these days you're going to have kids some of you got grandchildren some of you got grandchildren that aren't here yet but one of these days God's going to bless you with grandchildren and uh, I'd just like to invite you right where you're sitting there to just uh, and some of you are thinking well I'm not having kids I don't plan on having kids pray anyway but pray right now let's just bow our heads and close our eyes and, and uh, I want you to pray for your grandchildren first of all some of you, again, you don't have kids yet. I'm praying God to give you grandchildren. But pray for them and pray right now. God, may I be a grand grandmother, grandfather that leaves a legacy of faith in you because of the new person I am in Jesus Christ. That my impact will reach far into the future impacting generation after generation after generation. But the Lord, as I back it up even to now, my grandchildren, my children who need to be saved, begin today working on their hearts, drawing them to yourself so that they will be able to come to know you when the time is right. Father, as I bow over all these folks and lift them up, Lord, there's people in our hearts and minds that aren't children or grandchildren. There's loved ones, co-workers, acquaintances that we, as far as we know, we don't know that they know you. And if they were to die today, they would spend eternity separated from you. Lord, tonight, give us a desire to intentionally go to that person to tell them about Christ so that they too might hear the greatest news they could ever hear. One heart at a time, Lord, I pray. One heart at a time. She'll begin to move in this place and in this community be a mighty wave of salvation because even if one person in this room will no longer settle for complacent Christianity enjoying the joy of heaven and the eternal future with you while everybody else around them dies and goes to hell one person Lord even if it's just one May the next Billy Graham be in this room tonight. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Are we done? Don't want to cut it off too soon. Anybody else need to move? need to say something about what God did? Anyone? Boy, it was sure good. I, I feel the presence of God in here tonight. Amen. Amen. We need to get out there this next few days and bring him in. Amen. That's what we need to do. We need to get him here. Amen. Well, same time, same, same station tomorrow night. Amen.
Amen. Brother, would you close us in prayer, sir? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful uh, for this evening, Lord, and we're thankful uh, for Brother Kelly coming and, and sharing with us, Lord. And Lord, I, pr I pray that uh, 